The content of this podcast is provided for general informational purposes only and is not intended as, nor should it be considered a substitute for professional medical advice. Welcome to Itchy and Bitchy, a podcast that provides answers to your many unanswered health questions. I am Karen Nickel, family nurse practitioner. And before we get into today's episode, I want to update you on my course for perimenopausal women. After talking to many, many women who are in this phase of life, I have developed a comprehensive course to help address the symptoms so many women experience in their 30s, 40s, and even early 50s. If you want to talk to me about the course, we will put the link to schedule an appointment with me on our website, itchyandbitchy.com, and our Facebook page, I and B Podcast. So there you have it. So here in Knoxville, we have had weeks of rainy weather with temperatures in the 40s and 50s. I am sharing that weather report with you because those are the conditions that are most likely to trigger my Raynaud's syndrome symptoms. So I wanted to talk to you about Raynaud's today. And in the medical literature, Raynaud's syndrome is often described as a rare disorder, but I see it frequently amongst my patients, my family, and my friends. What is the deal? The fact that my office is over air conditioned, and I mean, I mean, freezing, may be the reason I saw so many patients with Raynaud's. I don't know, but it's possible. Actually, an estimated 15 to 30 million or more Americans suffer from Raynaud's but only 10% are aware that their pain and discomfort have a medical explanation and seek treatment. So the perceived rarity of the syndrome may actually be due to the fact that it's underdiagnosed. While both men and women suffer from the condition, women are nine times more likely to be affected. Some researchers estimate as many as 20% of all women in their childbearing years have Raynaud's. If you are wondering if you are one of the undiagnosed Raynaud's sufferers, you could take this quick quiz to help sort that out. First, are your fingers or toes often cold, even indoors on a warm day in air conditioning? Two, do you feel pain or discomfort when holding a cold glass or putting your hands in the freezer? Three, do your fingers and toes change color in response to cold exposure, temperature changes, or stressful situations? And these colors can include white, blue, purple, or red. Do you get numbness or pain in your extremities when you're cold or stressed? Number five, are your fingers or or toes so painful when cold and stressed that it's difficult holding objects or wearing shoes? If you've answered yes to all these questions, I recommend that you discuss these symptoms at your next appointment with your healthcare provider because you may have Raynaud's. There are two categories of this syndrome. Raynaud's can occur as a primary disease that is with no associated disorder. Most people with these symptoms have primary Raynaud's disease, and that makes up 80 to 90% of the cases. This type doesn't have a known cause or is what we call in the medical biz idiopathic. And this is the type that I have. It can occur as a secondary condition related to other more serious diseases such as scleroderma, lupus, and rheumatoid arthritis. What else can make you predisposed to your, this condition? Your gender. All of you out there listening who are yelling, being a woman, you are correct. Women are significantly more likely to suffer from Raynaud's than men. Yet another benefit of womanhood. Can you guess why women are more prone? If you're screaming out, because we have estrogen, you are right again. Good job. 
Some animal research has suggested that estrogen levels may impact blood flow and therefore cause the phenomenon in women, but there's really no hard and fast explanation. It may also be because more women get autoimmune diseases. We've been told that smoking is a risk factor for Raynaud's syndrome. However, a 2007 study published in the American Journal of Medicine showed that women who are current smokers do not have a higher risk of developing Raynaud's. But there is an increased risk in men who are smokers. Heavy alcohol consumption in women, and that's eight or more alcoholic beverages per week, was associated with increased risk of Raynaud's, whereas moderate alcohol consumption in men was associated with reduced risk. It's super confusing. In both genders, moderate red wine consumption was associated with a reduced risk of Raynaud's. Just a reminder, moderate wine consumption in women is one five-ounce glass of wine daily. For men, of course, they get more. It's two five-ounce glasses of wine daily. So it's it's a little bit of a confusing study, but it, it appears that smoking is not a definitive risk factor for developing Raynaud's. So Raynaud's syndrome, sometimes called Raynaud's disease or Raynaud's phenomenon, is a vascular issue that occurs when, in cold conditions or in response to stress, the small, teeny tiny arteries that supply blood to the extremities narrow. This is an exaggerated response to whichever stimulus triggers it. Normally, when someone is exposed to cold temperatures, the hands and feet can get cold, which is the body's way of conserving core body heat, but the digits don't lose all blood supply and go numb, which is not normal. When I was a kid, oh, yeah. Yes, my symptoms go that far back. My friends all love to build snowmen, have snowball fights, and go ice skating in the park. I hated all that stuff. Hated it. But my dislike of skating may be partially due to the fact that I had to skate on super bumpy ice and wearing hand-me-down skates that didn't fit and had blades that were duller than a butter knife. So that may have contributed to my dislike. That definitely contributed, um, but the main reason I didn't like those activities was due to the fact that my hands and feet would be frozen and numb within minutes of being outside. I remember that I would come into the house and show my mother, who was a physician, I'd show her my white, numb fingers, and she would say, go run them under cold water. <laughs> what? I didn't heed the her advice. I, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I just, that didn't make sense to me. I thought she was out of her ever loving mind to suggest such a thing, but my instincts were correct. That was not going to solve the problem. Raynaud's syndrome does not create constant symptoms. Rather, it occurs in episodes or attacks. Several body areas can be involved like lips, ears, nose, and even nipples. I know, I know, but the fingers and toes are most common. Years ago, the problem got so bad for me that I started having symptoms in my tongue. And that's when I finally decided that I should have testing done for autoimmune disorders, which thankfully all that testing was negative. Raynaud's syndrome typically affects the fingers. And with primary type, interestingly, your thumb doesn't experience any symptoms. And this is true for me. I don't recall ever having thumb involvement. It's just, it's pretty interesting. However, if the thumb does become affected, this would indicate secondary Raynaud's phenomenon. So what does this syndrome look like? Well, when an episode occurs, the affected area turns pale or white due to lack of blood flow. Often you will see a distinct line between the normal oxygenated tissue and the white deoxygenated tissue. People absolutely freak out when they see my fingers like this. The affected area can turn blue and feel cold and numb since the tissue has lost oxygen. This stage is when it's really fun to type your office visit notes. 
And when you warm up and circulation restores, you can experience redness, swelling, and burning pain. This, to me, is the worst part of the episode because it's pretty darn painful. Over time, with repeated episodes, you can develop skin ulcers and gangrene in in really severe cases. My symptoms have been going on for so long, I I thought for sure I would have lost a fingertip or two by now. But so far, I've been lucky. Um, I'm still clipping all 10 fingernails. At first, you may only experience symptoms in one finger or toe. Then, however, it can move to your other digits, and each attack can last anywhere from a few minutes to hours. It's difficult to know how long the symptoms will last because each person can experience it differently, and there's not much information in the medical literature about the duration of the attacks. Sometimes it depends on how long you've been exposed to the trigger. So I'm going to talk about causes and treatments after this quick break. What is more important than your health? Make it about more than just the holidays this year with a gift of health from Everly Well. Give the gift of one or more of their over 30 at-home lab tests like food sensitivity and women's health to help your loved ones get further on their health goals. Everly Well is digital healthcare designed for you with personalized results and accessible tools for long-term health. With over 30 at-home lab tests and high-quality vitamins and supplements, you'll be able to find the perfect test for you or your loved one. The women's health, food sensitivity, and celiac disease screening tests are only a few of the options. Here's how it works. Everly Well ships products straight to you or your loved one with everything needed in one package. If you ordered an at-home test, the sample can simply be collected at home and shipped back to a certified lab in the prepaid envelope included with the test. Digital physician-reviewed results are sent straight to your preferred device in just days. It's so simple. Over 1 million people have trusted Everly Well to support their health and wellness. I have completed the food sensitivity testing, and it has helped guide my diet so I can feel my best. So as I think about holiday gifts for my family and friends, most of them don't need more stuff. So I plan on giving them the gift of agency over their health with access to information about their bodies with Everly Well testing. The gift of health has never been so easy to share than it is this holiday. For listeners of the show, Everly Well is offering a discount of 20% off an at-home lab test at everlywell.com slash itchy. That's everlywell.com slash itchy for 20% off your next at-home lab test. Everlywell.com slash itchy. Welcome back, everyone. When you have Raynaud's disease, it is not unusual to ask yourself, why the heck did this happen to me? I'm a healthy person, so what's happening? Unfortunately, medical science doesn't always offer an explanation. According to a 2013 research in the Journal of Vascular Surgery, although Raynaud's disease was first described in 1862, by French physician Maurice Renaud, hence the name. It remains a poorly understood condition. In fact, in primary Renaud's, the kind I have, there's no known cause. The version of this disease is not associated with any other health problems. There are two categories, as I mentioned before. Renaud's can occur as a primary disease, that is, with no associated disorder, It can also occur as a secondary condition related to other more serious diseases. People with autoimmune disorders and connective tissue disorders such as scleroderma, lupus, Sjogren's, and rheumatoid arthritis are much more likely to suffer from this problem. Blood disorders and atherosclerosis, which is hardening of the arteries, may also increase the risk. Medications, repetitive stress injuries, and chemical exposure can also lead to vascular problems in the hands and feet. 
when someone suffers from Raynaud's in connection with any of these causes, their case is known as secondary Raynaud's. So what are our treatment options? It would be nice if there was a magic pill to address Raynaud's symptoms, but we don't have that. So treatment almost entirely revolves around avoidance therapy, or in other words, prevention therapy. This means doing things to keep your hands and feet warm, even if you have to wear fuzzy slippers and gloves around the house, even in summer. For those who have stress-induced Raynaud's syndrome, using stress reduction techniques like biofeedback and meditation may do the trick. If taking measures to prevent attacks doesn't work, there are prescription medications that we use off-label to treat the problem. Off-label means the medication wasn't made for that purpose, but we found that it can help this problem. Most commonly, we use medications that help dilate or increase the diameter of the blood vessels, namely nitrates and calcium channel blockers. If the episodes are stress-induced, sometimes an antidepressant like Lexapro or Zoloft is prescribed. However, these meds have their share of side effects, so that has to be considered when medications are being prescribed. I have never opted to take a medication for the problem, primarily because I didn't want the side effects. So I've worked hard to find avoidance measures that work for me. My colleagues at work have also tried to help me by giving me a variety of of items to help the problem. One of the docs I work with gave me a pair of hander pants. Yes, I said hander pants. These are fingerless gloves that look like men's tidy whities It was a thoughtful, I think, gesture, but I felt I couldn't see patients all day wearing what looks like men's underwear on my hands. If you are dying to have a pair, though, uh, they are still, still available for purchase online, so go for it. Hander pants, they're called. The same doc also gave me these paper wristbands to keep my wrists warm, which was not super successful for me. I do a lot of hand washing during the day, so I just had a bunch of wet paper around my wrists. Uh, My nurses gave me a pair of fingerless gloves that are wired to plug into your computer to electrically warm the gloves. I thought it was brilliant But one day when I was using them, they started to smoke and burn. I ripped them off in time to prevent skin burns, but the gloves were fried, literally. I do not recommend trying this product. Uh, A better option is something called wristies. Um, These are fleece fingerless gloves that cover your wrists and includes a non-electric hand warmer uh, to slip into a little pocket in the glove. I have found that if I keep my wrists warm, I will have fewer episodes. So I have at least a half a dozen pairs of fingerless gloves floating around, and I wear them most of the time. I have also tried to keep my office warm, which is a challenge. I put plastic over the large air vent over my desk to keep cold air from blowing in on me. So... Yeah, I've had to get sort of creative to uh, up the temperature in my office. And everywhere I go, I'm always prepared, bringing along a jacket and fingerless gloves on hot days even to wear in places that have air conditioning blasting. I even bring a fleece blanket into movie theaters. I know, I am very embarrassing. I'm a very embarrassing person to be around. I know that. I am sure that over the years, I have garnered a few eye rolls from my husband and my son, Forrest, for marching around town with a blanket tucked under my arm. But hey, it works. Um, some, for some people, a coat with extra long sleeves that cover your hands has worked. Also, if you shop at the grocery store with a partner or a child who's old enough to shop separately from you... Ask them to get the items on the list from the refrigerated or freezer sections. If I have to go to the freezer section, I am bundled up as if I were going to the Arctic Circle. Seriously. Um, Dressing warmly, even on days when the temperature is in the 50s, really, really helps. 
as I said in the beginning of the episode, weather that is 50s and raining are my worst days because I don't always dress as warmly as I apparently need to. Another thing that can help is to wear gloves when handling frozen or refrigerated food items. I know it seems ridiculous, but you can have a pair of gloves in the kitchen to use when you're grabbing items from the fridge or freezer. Unfortunately, our culture tends to connect cold intolerance with a lack of mental and emotional fortitude. There are plenty of people who make fun of me for being so cold sensitive as I wear my fingerless gloves in summer, but they would understand if they had just one Reynolds attack. It's pretty miserable. Uh, The other thing I have to be careful with is when I carry bags of groceries, heavy bags of groceries in those plastic bags, um, just that pressure on my fingers will trigger it. So, you know, many people just don't realize that if I don't take these measures of bundling up and carrying bags a different way and walking around with a blanket, I could end up losing my fingertips, literally. I almost did with those, you know, gloves going on fire, but, you know. So I take it seriously, even when people poke fun at me. Even though I often don't look cool when I'm working to avoid the cold, I will keep throwing on layers and bundling up. I will also continue, as I am today, to educate people on this thing called Raynaud's Syndrome. I hope all of you out there who do not suffer from Raynaud's Syndrome and who live in a snowy clime will go outside this holiday season and make a snowman for me. I would so appreciate it. Many thanks to Everly Well for sponsoring today's episode. Please visit our Facebook page, INB Podcast, where you can leave comments or questions for me. Our website is itchyandbitchy.com. There are blogs with some of our subjects available for you to read there. On the Facebook page and website, we will have the information about how to schedule an appointment with me so that we can chat about my perimenopause course and how it can help you if you are going through this phase in life. As always, thanks to Forrest Winsel, our producer and composer of our theme music and the person who actually does all the work of putting things on the website and Facebook page. Thanks, Forrest. I appreciate it. Check out his album called An Awful Lot. Go to wherever you stream your favorite music to listen. If you don't know where to stream music, you can find the album on Apple Music or Spotify. Happy holidays. And as always, remember, your health is in your hands. (laughs) 